the whole of salvation history, that is to say, the whole story that we find written starting with the patriarchs and the prophets of old, the kings of the Old Testament, all of that story begins with a union between a man and a woman, a marriage of sorts, a special marriage between Adam and Eve. Man was made for woman and man and woman for man. This same story ends with a marriage feast, the wedding banquet of the Lamb, the union between Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. We do well, therefore, to understand and to take note of the significance of marriage because Jesus himself, as we heard in this gospel passage, refers to marriage as he begins to unfold the nature of God's relationship to his creation, that he takes interest in it, that in fact, most perennially represented by Jesus himself, not just as he takes an interest in it, but he loves it. He comes back to it even at the change of the tide. And in a countless series of failures on the part of the people, the chosen people of God, he nonetheless stays faithful to his promise. He made this promise even to Adam. And from that point forward, always stands firm and faithful. He is the faithful groom. He is the one who forgives all. It is we who tire to ask forgiveness. It is God himself who rectifies and reinstates the people of God, both individually and corporately, over and over again. Marriage is important because of all the kinds of relationships that God could have established with his people, it is a marital one, the most intimate kind of union. It's also an indication of how much he loves us. I've said to you before that the symbols in the sanctuary bespeak just this mystery, that the holy water font we hear is a place where by the waters of baptism people are reborn, that the church herself is not just a she, but also a mother, and she gives birth to new children. You and I are beneficiaries of this, and by virtue of our baptism, we have become sons and daughters of God, that the holy water font in this respect can be thought of as a womb, that this building and this sacred space in which we sit is a kind of protection, a maternal protection. Often, I uh, like to remind us and very often say that a mother's love is both the strongest and most fierce thing in the order of nature and also the most tender. It's a nurturing love, a love that is unique to a mother. That at the end of the day, the one thing you can be sure of is that mom loves me. And this is the gift of the maternity of the church, by the way, in the image of Mary, our mother in heaven, who's been given to us in just this way. So here you have Jesus once again referring to a banquet, a wedding banquet. And he sends his servants to invite those who are invited, those who he has chosen, invites them to the wedding feast. And some ignore this invitation. Others have contempt for it so much so that they seize the messengers and they kill them and otherwise mistreat them. This can be thought of as the countless times where we've been sent prophets and in our own times, saints who arise within a culture, a family, a, a space and time, and they tend to contradict that culture more than all the rest. They, they are a kind of remedy that if you want to know what the church teaches and what she's about, you have to look to the lives of the saints. They tend to exaggerate the thing that a culture neglects the most. They are willing to die for the very thing most worth living for. This is the gift of the saints. This is why you cannot throw away the church and everything despite all the difficulties we have, the internal persecutions, the failures of clerics and priests that are unspeakably horrible. You and I have lived through these times. Even now in the news, there are awful stories. But it's nonetheless that we stand here as a people of faith, that our faith is founded firmly on a, not just an abstract God or an idea or some ancient tomb that's meant for a select few in the back room of a Vatican office or a Vatican library, but ours is a faith founded on a living God who loves us, who weeps alongside us, 
that ours is a task to stand firm and to realize where our faith is, most especially in this sacrifice of praise where we have the gift of the Eucharist. Even now he comes back to us, despite it all. This invitation, therefore, that comes to us, the invitation to the wedding banquet, the feast of the Lamb, comes to us from a good father, a good God. Even when we have preferred everything to God, ours is not a proud God because even then he stoops to conquer us. When we have searched everywhere and ignored him, even then he sends out his invitation to all and any who would hear. Recently, I was, I mentioned at the beginning of Mass that I was with my brother David and we hiked this, uh, it was the highest point on the Continental Divide, it's called Gray's Peak. And it was there <clears throat> that I saw things that I had never seen before, a kind of beauty that I had never experienced. I don't know if it was the hypoxia, but I all the same, uh, you know, when I finally reached the summit, I was just so taken with this beautiful view, I mean, a three, th th 360 degrees all around me, there was a beauty that could not be denied. It was breathtaking. And as is our wont, when you have Johnson brothers together, we tend to get very philosophical very quickly. No time for shallow chat. And on the way down from this mountain, we were talking about many, the many problems that we face, both uh, within the world, how upsetting it is to see uh, civil unrest and social distress, prejudice and racism, uh, and all, all variety of issues, warfare and conflict, starvation, and so many ways in which people are suffering. In the somewhat, at times, what seems to be futile ways that we seek to right these wrongs. Not just that, but also the wounds that are dark and deep in the church itself. Not coming as an attack from without, but from within. It's a moral rot that needs to continue by our prayers and our faithfulness. We pray for God's mercy and pray that he would heal us, heal the body of Christ, and bring us back close to his heart. We were discussing all these things, and in a moment we looked up and we saw this space around us. Once again, just it stole over us how beautiful this space was. And so we sat down and we talked for a few minutes. And it occurred to me in that conversation that it's important for us to remember that God is good. That God is good. It, we hear that all the time. But just to note that this invitation comes from a God who we can trust. He tells us the truth. He seeks, out, he seeks us out like the hound of heaven, as the poet puts it. And always wants us to come back to remember that this invitation is always extended to us, it's always on loan, that ours is a good father who keeps his promises. He makes good on everything he said down through the centuries and even now. It's very easy to see the goodness of God in beauty. Uh, Bishop Barron has often reflected that the salvation that will come to us in our time will be through the beauty of our faith something that we cannot water down, but we always and constantly have to refer to. To love God, by the way, with your mind is to study sacred things. There's never a point where we're done with that task. It's also the case that we hear in this gospel passage today that there was someone who did not come with the right garments. I often like to think that this is a great exhortation to wear our Sunday best when we come to church, to, to be conscientious about that to realize that this is a sacred space. More than that, we are going to be in the presence of the creator of the cosmos. We already are in his presence, but in a special way, he comes back to us, the eternal son of God, Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. I want to look my best in that context as I stand before the Lord and pray that you would accept that same exhortation. It's also the case that we are in constant need of his mercy. That this is the gift of reconciliation, a sacrament that restores us to the original innocence of our baptism. There's a beautiful tradition within the Hispanic Latino American culture where after baptism and after the rites of baptism are over, uh, the priest would carry the baby 
around so that the people can touch it. Because in that moment, it's their faith and in fact is true that that little baby is the closest thing to heaven in the room. Made a new little saint by virtue of the forgiveness and healing of baptism and the elevation of participation in, in the very life of God himself in the image of Jesus Christ. That's what we believe. And so they touch the baby, praying for God's blessing, both for the baby and for ourselves. It's a beautiful tradition and one that we do well to remember. But it's also true that every time someone passes exiting the confessional, they too share in that same grace, that gift. We need to keep our wedding garments proper, unstained, unsullied as we come into God's presence. To remember that this is sacred space. To give that example to our children and to those that look to us for guidance. So let us pray together for our church. Let us pray that we would accept this invitation however it comes to us, in unexpected ways very often. But that we would hear that invitation and heed the words of the Father who invites us to the wedding feast of his Son. And that the gift of that good news would shine in our hearts and always instill in our hearts the gift of hope. Hope for perfection. Hope for goodness. Hope that is firmly founded on the Lord of life and all goodness. Amen.